I'm loving it so much. Because honestly, I avoid the parables. Uh, for some reason, I, I, I don't study them the way I probably should. I guess as Protestants, we tend to study the Pauline epistles a lot more than anything else. But um, why wouldn't we study the words of Jesus? So I'm, I'm loving it. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot about God's kingdom and how it works. So today, brothers and sisters, we look at the parable of the rich fool. That sounds nice, huh? So, from the standpoint of material wealth, Americans have difficulty realizing just how rich we are. Going through a little mental uh, exercise suggested by Robert Hellbroner can help us to count our blessings. Imagine doing the following, and you will see how daily life is for as many as a billion people in the world today. It's probably more like two to three billion today. The population of the world has continued to boom. So if you want to understand what it's like to live for most people on the planet, not, not just Americans, but for most people, first thing you'd want to do is take all the furniture out of your apartment or your home except for one table and a couple of chairs. Use blanket and pads for beds. So no, no, no bed or bed frame, just, just a blanket and pads for bed. Number two, take away all of your clothing except for your oldest dress or suit shirt or blouse, leave only one pair of shoes. Three, you'd have to empty your pantry and the refrigerator, except for a small bag of flour, some sugar and salt, a few potatoes, some onions, and a dish of dried beans. Now, unfortunately, uh, you'd also have to dismantle the bathroom, sh sh shut off the running water, and remove all the electrical wiring in your house as well. It's going to be a lot of work, but yeah. You you can do it. Um, so you have to remove all that. Also, you, you're, you're going to have to take away the house itself. Um, and you're going to have to move the family into the shed and back. So there's also that. Now place your house, the, sh the shed that you're living in now, in a shanty town. They tend to maybe look like this. This looks like a bit of a nicer one, actually. Uh, there, there are roads. Um, yeah, that is actually a nicer one. Maybe I should have found a yuckier one to look at. There are some really nasty ones. But Next, you'd have to cancel all subscriptions to newspapers, streaming services, magazines, book clubs, internet. There, that's no great loss to you because now none of you can read either. So, yeah, you can't read anyway, so there's not a lot of point. Also, as far as entertainment goes, you can only leave one radio uh, for, for the whole shanty town. So, then you have to move the nearest hospital or clinic 10 miles away. And instead of doctors and nurses and administrators, it would just be one midwife in charge instead of a doctor. Um, then you'd also have to throw away your bank books, stock certificates, pension plans, and insurance policies and then leave a, a family cash hoard of about $10 stored in a, in a bag or a container somewhere in your home. Next, you have to give the head of the family uh, a few acres to cultivate, in which you can raise a few hundred dollars of cash crops, of which one third will go to the landlord and one tenth to the money lenders. Then also lot off, off, off 25 or more years in life expectancy. So by comparison, how rich are we when we look at how most people live in the world? And with our wealth comes responsibilities to use it wisely, not to be wasteful and to help others. It's the, that's kind of our theme today, is to think about the wealth that we have and how we can use it. Okay? You know, sometimes we can forget in the United States just how wealthy we are. When we read the scriptures, we find many references to wealth and the danger of trusting in wealth before we trust in God. But we must always remind ourselves we've been entrusted with much wealth in the United States. Every one of us here, and we're called to use it wisely. Wealth can be deceitful if we're not careful. Do you recall the account of the rich young ruler? Maybe this is what it would look like today. He pulls up in his fancy car and Jesus talks to him, you know. I remember uh, growing up, I was sort of middle class. And I, I kind of had this middle class friend. And we would cruise around in his uh, BMW. And uh, we thought we were so fancy, you know. We wore our, we 
wore our button-up shirts and we thought we were so cool and we thought we were so much better than everyone. And uh, I just imagine maybe Jesus would have, we would have pulled up and we would have been like, who's this dude in rags, you know? Like, what's he all about? And Jesus is the savior of the world, but he comes in a way we don't always expect. If you, if you remember, what did Jesus say to the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus wanting to justify himself. And Jesus uh, called him out. He said, well, you're, you're missing one thing. Sell all your possessions and then come follow me. Now, is that a requirement for every follower of Jesus to sell everything they own? No. But Jesus was calling out what he knew was at the center of that man's heart. Money. There's a big dollar sign at the center of his heart. And the rich young ruler walked away sad. The rich young man walked away sad because he had great wealth and he loved his wealth. That was the problem. It wasn't that he had money, that's not a problem. The problem is that he loved his money. He loved it. But we often read that and we say, well, I can't relate. I'm not a rich young ruler. You know, I'm not very wealthy. And by American standards, you know, I'm, I'm not that well off. But when we look at the rest of the world, and, and take a look at this. This is from, uh, this is a prayer written by Philip Yancey and Paul Brand in their book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. It says, Dear Lord, I have been rereading the record of the rich young ruler and his obviously wrong choice. But it has set me thinking. No matter how much wealth he had, he could not ride in a car, have any surgery, turn on the light, buy penicillin, hear a pipe organ, watch TV, wash dishes in running water, type a letter. That, that kind of ages the quote, doesn't it? Type a letter? What, like a typewriter? <laughs> Mow a lawn, fly in an airplane, sleep on an inner spring mattress, or talk on the phone. If he was rich, then what am I? Mm. Each of us today are, in at least some ways, as wealthy as the rich young ruler. And this brings us to our parable today. From Luke chapter 12, let's take a look at the context before we look at it. It's, it's, here's the context of what was happening in Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, he, okay, I, I love this. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance of me. Oh, dude. Man. This, this gets me up. I'll finish here, but I'm, I'm already getting upset. Jesus replied, man. <clears throat> I like that. Man. 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 Who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Before we go into Jesus' response here, I just got to start with a question. Oh, uh, man, dude. Okay, think about this. Think if you're lucky enough to live in the time of Jesus. You are literally standing face to face with the living God. What do you ask him? <clears throat> My brother owes me money, dude. Oh. Mm -mm. Man, I'm, I'm getting dizzy up here. Whoa. No. What are you doing? This is our problem as humans, I think. You know? We, we, we miss the main point. We're sitting there with the Son of God. What do we say? Bro, tell my brother to divide the money with me. Have you ever seen or been part of a nasty dispute of, of, uh, in relation to an inheritance? Oof, that's the worst, isn't it? And the family fights over the, 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 the wealth of the family member, and it gets ugly and after the parents die. I've seen this before. I did an arbitration once around that very table back there between, I think, six sisters. Four sisters. It wasn't six. Four sisters. And it was ugly as they fought over their mother's money. My goodness. The fight for possessions, the fight for money. And often, the family will break apart 
to no longer communicate like they used to, right? So that's how it was, you know, on my dad's side of the family. When my grandma and grandpa passed away, just the family doesn't get together anymore. It's disappointing, but it's, it's amazing how important the parents are to hold the glue of the family together, though. Isn't that interesting? We, it's like we need our parents to be there to hold us all together. But in any case, in the situation the man came to Jesus, he's standing a few free feet from the living God. He's got the opportunity to ask any question. He could ask, Lord, what is the meaning of life? God, what, what is your purpose for my life? What's heaven like? What, what was it like to, to descend and become a baby? Uh, what is, explain the plan of salvation in detail. You know, what's, how does it all work? He could have asked any of these questions. What will the end times be like, Lord? Instead, he brings up a petty dispute about money. And Jesus rebukes him, and he says, I'm, I'm not a judge in your case. Um, secondly, be on guard about this lust for money. That's the first point I want to emphasize with you today. In general, in your Christian life, you need to be on guard. On guard. Be on guard. Be on guard. We see this throughout the New Testament. Be on guard against all sorts of things. Be on guard against laziness. Be on guard against lust. Be on guard against lukewarmness. It's a common saying in the New Testament, be on guard. But today the emphasis is to be on guard against greed. So what does it mean to be on guard? That's kind of the first point I want to hit on here today. I think we keep a watch, right? You got the security guard, he's got his badge, he's got his uniform. He's watching on the security cameras, making sure stuff is staying, staying safe. And in the same way, in your own life, keep a watch on your life. Keep watching. Is, am I starting to love my money a little too much? Am I starting to love my possessions a little too much? Just keep a watch on those things. Think to yourself, is this gaining a foothold in my heart? Well, it, no. Let, let's put that back where it belongs in prayer. You know, and say, Lord, no, I don't, I don't care about my money. Mm -hmm, that's yours anyway. We just, we keep a guard, keep a watch on it. That's wise. It's a wise thing to do. Here's a key question for the sermon as well. Am I trusting in my wealth for my safety in life? Or am I really trusting in God? Believe me, brothers and sisters, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of Christians, I believe, in the United States, when it comes right down to it, they are really trusting, not in Jesus Christ, for their daily needs, for their life, for, for their breath, for everything. They are trusting in their own affluence, they're trusting in their money, they're trusting in their own ability. And we as Americans are beaten on the head day and night, day and night with that message, aren't we? Be better. Be doing yourself. Drag yourself up by your own bootstraps. Work harder. Work harder. We're slammed with that day and night. And I want you to change your mindset and say, no, that is not how it works in God's kingdom. I do not force myself. I do not push myself. I am not the one who gains. I am not the one who controls. I am not the one who builds the wealth. It is God who I trust to do that in my life. we got to change that mindset and switch those things around. Because we do not want to say, I'm a hard-working American, and I'm adding God into that. No, I'm not adding God into anything. No, God is taking over, and I'm changed. I'm different. And my base mindset now is, God's in control. I'm not. My wealth belongs to Him. And <clears throat> my ability means nothing. He's in charge. And I will tell you, God gives me an opportunity to live that out. Believe me, whenever I preach a sermon, the week prior, I get the chance to learn to live that out. Now on my way back, driving back, uh, yesterday... Could I rely on my own strength? No, I couldn't. I could not rely on my own strength. Just 
Justin is a you know fairly strong guy. I work out, you know. I I, I'm, I'm, I, I got my bank account. I got my things. I got my car, my Salvation Army issued car, you know. And guess what? On my drive back, I couldn't. It didn't matter that I had a nice car. It didn't matter that I had um, my my brilliant abilities to drive. It didn't matter that I had all these things. I was completely dependent on God to make to bring me back safely, wasn't I? And without him, there was no hope. And even after departing, he stopped me an hour later and said, did you forget? And I said, Lord, no, I didn't forget. And I prayed again, and the rest of the way, he brought me safely. But what, where, where was my footing, you know? Where was my footing? And God will often, uh, as we're jogging along in life, <clears throat> and we're starting to rely, rely on ourselves again, he will, let me just stop you there, you know? Or he lets us overexert ourselves until we collapse. Or something hits us where we're forced again to realize, wait a minute, I'm not self-sufficient. I can't be self-sufficient. My self-sufficiency is nothing. I've got to rely completely on God, and only then can I survive. And God reminds us of that. Thank God. You know? Thank God. Because what if he didn't? What if he let me continue to go on in my self-sufficiency? I'd become arrogant. i start to think, I did this myself. I got sober myself. I got clean myself. I became a pastor by my own brilliance. And pretty soon I'd be an arrogant jerk, and I'd probably end up out of the ministry after some sort of tawdry affair or something. You know? It would destroy me. But God often gives us the gift of some sort of trip-up. You know, you get sick. You, you have a fight with someone. You, I don't know, something happens in your life that forces you to reflect and say, "Wow, I'm not in control. Only God is." And then, and then I realign, and God's at the center again, and self is submitted to Him. But oftentimes, we can slowly start to replace self at the center. God submitted to self. Ooh, that's blasphemy. That's awful. Don't do that. No. God at the center, self-submitted to God. And yeah, then God will say, okay, now use your abilities for my glory, but rely on me through all of it. So, make sense? Okay, well, one person gets it. Anyone else? <laughs> all right, amen. Praise the Lord. So, I want you to keep this in your mind. Who am I relying on for the rest of the sermon? What am I relying on? My wealth, my abilities, or God? So in the context of this conversation with this man who wants money and, and, and inheritance, Jesus tells our parable today. He says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. Then I'll have to, and then I'll say to myself, "You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry." But God said to him, "You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself?" This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Wow. What's going on in this parable? When we first read this on a surface level, I mean, the first time I read through this, I was like, it seems like the rich man is being fairly wise, right? He had a good, he, he, he had a good uh, har harvest, so he's, he's creating bigger barns to store uh, what, he, what he got. Is, is he doing something wrong here? At first I thought, you know, what's the issue here? He, he tears down his barns, he built bigger ones, stores a surplus grain, okay, reasonable. But then we see the key issue here. He says to himself, you have plenty of grain, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Here's the massive problem in this situation. He is what? He's trusting in his wealth. He is leaning on his wealth. He's saying, ah, I've stored up wealth. 
and I'm good now. I'm going to put up my feet and everything's safe now. All safe because I've stored up wealth. Oh, how many rich people in our world live this way? Their wealth is a, is a, is a, is a fortress surrounding them, right? And, and they, they, they will sue someone and, 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 and counter sue and they'll, they'll use their money. They'll have lawyers. They got all this legal defense and stuff and they'll use their money to buy out the competition and it's their weapon, you know, their power. He's trusting in his wealth. And sometimes I worry that we as Americans, as Christians in America, we can do this as well. We say, hey, I, I have my bank account with the money in it. I have my insurance plan. I have food stored up in my fridge and cupboards. I have the United States government and the laws and the police and, and, and the military and, and my family and my children, my relatives. I have all I need. And very slowly and very quietly and a bit arrogantly, we slowly shift God off the throne as we trust in the God of money and power and prestige over the only true and living God. Are you guilty today of this crime against God to trust in your own wealth, in your own ability? That is another question to ask ourselves today when it comes right down to it. Where the rubber meets the road, do you trust in God or in your finances and personal power? How does God respond to the rich man who puts off his feet and trusts in his big bank account? God speaks to him this way. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? God calls him a fool. That's serious stuff. Because we're told in the scriptures that a fool is the worst someone can be. A fool is someone... Like in the book of Proverbs, which we've been studying in our life group uh, the last few weeks, someone who is completely wrong in everything. Like a fool is just wrong, and they can't get it right. And in fact, it, it, it even says that if you, if you try to correct a fool, that, that they're just going to laugh in your face. Like there's just a fool is someone who's just way down the wrong course. God says to this person, so tonight you're going to die. What's going to happen to all the wealth you accumulated? It's gone in the blink of an eye. It will all go to someone else for an inheritance. But he would have lost everything. Why? Not because he stored up wealth. That's not the issue here. He's not in the wrong because he stored up wealth. That is not a bad thing to do. If, you are storing, if you're storing money in a bank account, I'm not rebuking you, okay? If you're storing up, if you're canning food in your, in your pantry, that's not wrong. That's not a wrong thing to do. No. The point is he was trusting in that as his protection. He was trusting in that as his power. He was trusting in that, when you get right down to it, as his God. And he worshipped at the altar of, the, of what he had. Do not do that. If you do got money saved up, great. If you've got food stored up, great. Don't trust in it. Do not trust in it. And I'm going to explain to you a few ways where we can keep it from getting its claws into us, to kind of keep it back. Like, okay, bank account, you're over there, fine. You're not going to get your claws in me about what you are. We'll get there in a second. So, this, this rich fool is trusting in the wealth for his security in life. He is not trusting God. He is poor in the things of God and rich in worldly wealth. His soul is doomed to hell as a result. Particularly in the United States, this is a serious concern. We can often have a sort of cultural Christianity, a sort of lukewarm Christianity. We think to ourselves that we're trusting in God, but we're actually trusting in our own affluence. I want to draw in another scripture from the book of Revelation to illustrate this point. It says in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 18, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you either or one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, uh, they're, they're saying to themselves, right? You say to yourself, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Who does that sound just like? The rich fool. I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. 
Jesus just says it. <laughs> he didn't, he's got no politically correct thing. He just says that you're poor, blind, and naked. He says, I counsel you. He doesn't just rebuke them, though. He says, I counsel you to do this. Buy from me. He's, he's, he's using their own wealth that, that kind of to cut through to him. He's saying, buy from me not gold, but gold refined in the fire. So you can become rich and white clothes to wear. So you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put in your eyes so you can see. He's, he's saying, oh, you, you, you like gold, huh? Let me refine your soul into pure gold. He's saying, oh, you like nice clothes? Let me give you my garments of righteousness that are perfectly white. Oh, you like fancy creams and oils? Let me give you salve for your eyes so that you can see. This is from the seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. And some believe that the letter to the church of Laodicea here is actually referencing the body of Christ today in the leading up to the end times. The lukewarm church that trusts in wealth in the West instead of trusting in God. I think to myself, man, that sounds pretty right, doesn't it? So... God is saying to some of us today, hey, you think you're covered in my righteousness, but you are not. So instead of trusting money, trust in me. I'll give you clean white clothes to wear, sell for your eyes so you can see, and a new golden beautiful spirit refined in the fire. So in conclusion today, I want to give you some tips to make sure you keep God first as the trusted support for your life, okay? One, and this is stuff I do. So I'm afraid of wealth and money and power and affluence, and believe me, I'll tell you this, I don't look at that yet, um, I'll tell you this, I'm prone to pride. I think all of us are to a certain extent, but i got to keep a watch on that. I'm prone to be egotistical and prideful. So i gotta, I got to do this stuff that we're going to look at here. Always pray over every meal. It makes a bigger difference than you realize. And when you pray, say this, God... We know this food doesn't come from our wealth. No. It's a gift from you. Okay? It's a big deal. Big deal. Because you are saying to God when you do that, this food is not mine. I did not provide it. God, you provided it. So you start to think, well, I paid for it. Did you? Who grew it out of the ground? Whose ground did it grow out of? You know? Who, who, who put the cattle on the hills that they slaughtered for it? God did. Whose money is it anyway? God's. It's a gift from you, God. Two, when you receive your pay, set aside the tithe. And when you do, say to God, Lord, this is not my money. This is your money. And I will steward it to honor you. And every once in a while, as you sit at home, Look around at all your possessions, your furniture, your bed, paintings on the walls, clothes, vehicles, and say, Lord, I know none of this comes from me. That's a big deal. Look around your house. Look, right, look at your car and say, just every once in a while, as you're driving around town, as you're looking around your house, as you're laying in bed, say, Lord, oh, look at all this nice stuff. It's not a gift from me. It's a gift from you, God. Lord, I know none of this comes from me, my abilities or talents. No, all this comes from you, God. And we're setting things in the right order in our minds then. Because egotistically we can start to think, well, look at all I've provided. Look at all I did. Look at, look at that beautiful painting I picked out. No, set it in the right order. And as you repeat that in prayer, it'll stay right in your mind. You'll realize this car I'm driving around belongs to God, and it is a gift from him. God, would you pray with me? Declare this with me. Actually, why don't you repeat after me? God, you are my provider. Everything I have is from you. Everything America has is from you. Without you, Lord, we are nothing. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, 
we're going to have a concluding song today. And I just want you, as you, as you listen to this song, and sing along if you want, um, this song is, is all about, is he worthy? And I want you to be asking yourself in your own mind, who's worthy to be on the throne of my heart? Money, wealth, affluence, my own abilities, or the living son of God? Who's worthy? Is, is he worthy? So reflect on that right now. And will this will also be our response time. So I just want you to put things in order in your mind. Just say, Lord, it's all from you. <laughs>